jury. So right there we have the right to a jury trial in Article 3. Um, and it's going to be held in the state where said crimes shall have been committed. So district courts in the states. But when not committed within any state, the trial should be held in such place or places as the Congress by law shall have directed. Generally those happen in Washington, D.C. So if it's a maritime law or something like that. So what is judicial review? Okay, this is actually the last question in your set of questions. I don't know why I'm so out of order on that, but I am. This is the last question. It's the power of an independent judiciary to determine whether the acts of other or other components of the government are in accordance with the Constitution. Now, I'm gonna give you an example of that in just a second. But the main thing is this. If Congress passes a law, if the president signs into place a executive agreement or um, executive action, if the state of Oklahoma passes a law or the school board for Cleveland County or Norman passes a regulation, if that abrogates the Constitution, I can bring a case or any citizen that is affected thereof, there has to be an actual case or controversy, it has to affect me, right? Then I can bring a case and say, hey, you can't do this, it's unconstitutional, okay? And so it can go to the Supreme Court, we're gonna talk about how it gets there in a minute. And the Supreme Court can say, hey, Cleveland County School Board, you can't do that, okay? State of Oklahoma, you can't do that, it's unconstitutional. All right. So in those Federalist Papers I was talking about, in the Federalist Papers I was talking about um, the deal with the Judiciary Branch, they do talk about judicial review. It's not in the Constitution, but it's in the papers that say this is what the ju Judiciary can do, okay? Because we use a system of, the law, of law in the United States that is the common law system. Do you guys know anything about that? Zachary? It's like, um, isn't it kind of like derived from English law in a sense? Um, and kind of, it's like based off of like the Magna Carta and it builds off of that, but. Okay, it's derived from English law, okay? And it has to do with decisions that judges made in various courts that were then built upon. So, for example, in Great Britain, okay? There's a whole body of law that is considered to be their constitution, but it's not one document, okay? It starts with Magna Carta, um, but there are other things that come from that. But there are areas of civil law and criminal law where the courts have made decisions that are binding, okay? And so they can say, hey, you can't do that because we already have this in place, okay? This is called precedent. This is an important word, okay? Precedent essentially means this. The court has made a ruling and courts that are below this court must follow that ruling. That's a precedent, okay? So we deal with a lot of precedents in law. In this case, this Supreme Court's really young. They don't even have a permanent place. They're going from place to place. And in 1800, Jefferson and Burr tie for the presidency. If there's a tie of the Electoral College, then what happens? Then it goes to a vote of the House of Representatives, right? Because like, yeah, I forgot that, but I know it now, I remember it for the final exam. <clears throat> so, um, but the key is, is if there's a tie in the Electoral College, then the House of Representatives gets to decide. And the House of Representatives, recently, the Democratic Republicans had swept to power, and Jefferson wins, okay? But John Adams is a Federalist, and he's going out. And so as he goes out, he starts appointing people left and right who are Federalists. Remember Federalists, Federalist Papers, kind of January, remember January? I know it was a long time ago, okay? Um, and so the Federalist Party is disappearing. This is their last gasp. And John Marshall is appointed. He becomes the Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he becomes the first real Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, number one. 
But number two, he becomes the most significant chief justice of the Supreme Court ever. And he puts into place a lot of the things that the Federalists were arguing for because he was actually there when the Constitution was being debated and whenever it was being signed into being. Okay? So he's been a part of this. So the Federalists in Congress put into place the Judiciary Act to protect government from hostile state governments. And they do a lot of things. It increases the power of their lower courts. Um, and then Adams is going to appoint Marbury to one of these courts. Okay? And so let's look really quick at what happens. Some scholars have called it the most important case in the history of the Supreme Court. What started out as a minor matter about federal jobs turned into a legal decision that resonates to this day. You want legal drama? You got it. This is the story of Marbury versus Madison. In 1800, Thomas Jefferson defeated John Adams in the presidential election. Just before he left office, Adams appointed a bunch of judges from his Federalist Party to the District of Columbia courts. These appointments were approved by the Senate and signed by the President. Great, but there was a whole lot. The last step before these judges could take office was a commission, a formal piece of paper that said essentially, this is their job and these guys are good to go. These commissions hadn't been delivered yet, which meant the judges couldn't start their jobs yet. And when President Jefferson took office in March of 1801, he said, not so fast on those commissions. He had his Secretary of State, James Madison, keep them from being delivered. One of those prospective judges was named William Marbury, a Federalist Party member from Maryland. Marbury said, no fair, I want my judge job, and he brought the case to the Supreme Court. Marbury wanted the court to issue a writ of mandamus. That's legalese for a court order. Marbury wanted the court to order Madison to show why he couldn't get his commission. In 1803, Supreme Court Chief Justice John Marshall himself, a Federalist appointed by John Adams, ruled on the case of Marbury versus Madison. He saw this as an opportunity to establish some important legal precedents, decisions that extended way beyond whether or not Marbury got his job. First, Marshall ruled that Marbury had the right to receive his commission. So that means I get my judge job, right? Relax, Marbury. Marshall also ruled that Marbury had a right to remedy, to have his wrong right. Okay, so I get my job. Yeah, not to relax, Marbury. Chill out, buddy. There was a third part to Marshall's decision, and this is what made Marbury versus Madison so important. Marshall ruled that the Supreme Court didn't have the power to make Madison hand over Marbury's commission. So wait, what? In making his ruling, Justice Marshall had the court rule on itself. Marshall brought up the Judiciary Act of 1789. This was a law that gave the Supreme Court the power to rule in cases just like this. But Marshall ruled that Section 13 of this law violated the Constitution because it gave the court powers that the Constitution said it shouldn't have. Long story short, it wasn't the Supreme Court's place to rule in a decision like this. In striking down the Judiciary Act of 1789, Marshall also struck a blow against the authority of Congress. The Constitution, as Marshall put it, was the supreme law of the land. Whenever Congress and the Constitution were in conflict, the Supreme Court would turn to the Constitution. This is called judicial review, and it's been an important function of the Supreme Court ever since. In relinquishing the power it was granted in 1789, the Supreme Court defined its emerging role for the young nation. The Court staked out its claim as a branch of government equal to and independent of Congress and the executive branch. All that from a case about someone's paperwork not getting delivered. people in large numbers came out. Okay, so in sum, right? In sum, listen. The United States uses a common law legal system. In common law legal systems, judges <coughs> set precedents that are then followed by other judges, okay? The Supreme Court, in which is vested the power of the judiciary, the, the, you know, it's the, of the law, of determining the law, um, had this power, but it had not been really established. It didn't say it specifically in the Constitution there was judicial review, even though it was alluded to in the Federalist Papers. And so in 
Marbury versus Madison. Chief Justice John Marshall says, the Constitution says this is our original jurisdiction and only this. Congress cannot give us other things of which we are the original jurisdiction. So we can't enforce this. In other words, if Congress had said it could go to the district court, that would have been fine. It could have been appealed all the way to us and we could have heard it. But we can't hear this court, origin this case originally, okay? And what's good about this, what's, what's clever about this is this. Jefferson got the result he wanted and he was president at the time. And at the time, the court didn't have much power. I mean, they, they couldn't enforce their rulings. Um, you know, it wasn't really clear what role they would have. And so if they had ruled something that Jefferson didn't want, that, hey, he's entitled to give his commission, then Jefferson could have done what? Ignored it, right? Refused to execute it, you know, enforce it. He could have just done that. So instead, Marshall was sneaky. He said, oh, yeah, yeah, he has the right to this commission, okay? He should absolutely get this, but unfortunately, we don't have that power, right? And it effectively killed the case because it had been going around for so long, and at this point, you know, Marbury's like, I'll just get another job, right? And so because of this, Jefferson gets what he wants. There's nothing to enforce. And the Supreme Court sends this into place, this idea that the court has judicial review without any way for somebody to push back against that. Okay? This is critical. They end up using it in Gibbons versus Ogden, right? You guys remember that case? Travel, right? In the ferry boat. Uh, they end up using it in uh, another key case that we looked at early on, which is the moment just the uh, Maryland. Uh, there we go. Um, Maryland versus Madison? No. Maryland. Marbury versus Maryland. Marbury. Marbury. That's not Marbury. Wait. This is Marbury. Yeah, wait, yeah. What? I'm sorry, no, I, I was getting confused. It's Maryland, our Maryland case from the beginning about the bank. It's not sticking in my head right now. Hold on, it'll come back in a second. It's another M, right? Sometimes they disappear. Sometimes they just go to my McCulloch. Uh, but the point is, is that they were able to, huh? McCulloch v. Maryland. McCulloch, thank you. So McCulloch versus Maryland. Uh, mm -hmm. And so at that point, right, these cases were taken seriously because they had established the power of judicial review and there was no way to push back against that. And so John Marshall, he is the chief justice and the architect of all of those cases, of all those rulings. Okay, all right, so original jurisdiction, what does that even mean? It means a court can hear the facts of the case, okay? That's what it means. It means that whenever you go into a courtroom, you present the facts, the judge applies the law, right? And also, attorneys argue for a particular interpretation of the law as they're applied to the facts, okay? And the judge or the jury makes a determination on the facts. Appellate jurisdiction is only on the law. How many of you saw the documentary Making a Murderer? Yeah, right? It's rough. It's a rough one. What happens there? It's been a while. <laughs> well, uh, I can't remember the guy's name, but he gets Brandon connected. Darcy. No, Brandon. Brandon. Darcy. There we go. Well, he gets, uh, charged with sexual assault and then later they figure out with DNA evidence it was, you know, not guilty and allegedly, you know, he did it again or murdered somebody else after that and went back to prison. Okay, I think we're thinking of different ones, so maybe I'm saying the wrong one, which is absolutely positive because I never choose documentaries, as you guys know, my husband forces me to watch them. But the case I'm thinking about is the Brandon <laughs> Dassey case, right, where he is a kid and he's also mentally retarded. Okay, he, or he's mentally disabled, right? Severely. And he is badgered. Eric told me that he told you guys in class that the police can lie to you and you were shocked. 
The police can lie to you, right? They have to tell you your rights, but if you don't take advantage of them, they will lie to you, all right? The way things are set up, the way that it is set up, it's in favor of the police. I know it seems shocking. I, th I think it's important to know that they can lie about evidence. Yeah, they can lie about evidence. They can say, and they can say, hey, this person just told that it was you that did it. And I have a gun with your fingerprints on it. They can lie about all of it. Or a video tape. Yeah. Right? So, again, my advice to you that I gave you when we were talking about rights of the accused is you have a few words that you could say if you're ever arrested or brought in for questioning. What are those words? I would like a lawyer. I want my lawyer. That's right. Okay? Those are the words you can use. Right? And you can say it over and over again. I'm fine with that. Until they get you one. Okay? But understand that they can lie to you, they can badger you. I mean, there's a certain level where it becomes torture that they can't do, but those lines are not clear. They're not clear, okay? So, my point is, is that the facts of the case in that particular case were presented, and you know, you have a kid who says, yeah, I did it, um, I shot her. And uh, she wasn't shot, right? And they said, oh, don't you mean you bludgeoned her? Oh, yeah, I mean I bludgeoned her, right? These facts are presented to the jury. The jury still says guilty. When the court hears this case, they can't hear the facts. They can't take the facts into consideration. All they can do is to take into consideration whether the law or the legal procedure was abrogated. That's an appeal. Does that make sense? Okay, so it's good to have a trial lawyer at the beginning who knows what they're doing. That's first. Appellate jurisdiction, like I said, is the law only. Okay, the Supreme Court has both original jurisdiction and appellate jurisdiction. It is the only court that has both. Okay, so how do you get there? Well, if it is a particular type, case involving a state government or foreign diplomat, something like that, the Supreme Court has original jurisdiction and they can hear it first, if they choose to. But they can push it down too and make it appellate. They don't have to take that case. But they do have original jurisdiction and can hear the facts, okay? The other way that they get there is this. Most case, the vast majority of cases in the United States are local, state level, county level, district court cases, okay? And the vast majority of them never go to trial, okay? So I want you to think about that too in terms of the legal system. If at the state trial court I get a verdict I do not like, then I can appeal Anything that I have made an objection to in terms of the application of the law, so maybe introduction, introduction of evidence, for example. For example, my phone was on my seat, I was pulled over, right? And I was taken into custody for drug, uh, drug uh, selling, selling of the drugs. <laughs> Sorry. My brain is not working today. So I'm taking drug trafficking. There we go. That's the one, right? But they don't find very much on me. What they do find is they take my phone and they look and they can see all the stuff in my phone where I've said I've done things and they present this in evidence. The Supreme Court, if this is put in evidence without a warrant, the Supreme Court has said no. Because why? The Fourth Amendment the right of the people to be secure in what? Their persons, papers. their houses, their papers and effects shall not be abrogated unless a warrant is issued that specifically names the thing to be searched. Right? Okay. So they can't use that. And so if my attorney at court says, hey, objection, you can't enter that into evidence, there was no warrant, 
and judge says, ah, oh, we'll see it, then we can appeal on that. If there's no objection, we can't appeal on it. Okay? So this is the law that we're doing. So we've appealed on that to state appeals courts, maybe the state Supreme Court. Oklahoma and Texas, by the way, weird. They're the only two that have two separate courts of last instance. One is for civil, one is for criminal. Every other just has one, okay? If there is a federal question, if there is a federal question, then you can appeal it to the Supreme Court if your verdict is not, or if the decision by that court is not what you want it to be. The Supreme Court will then decide whether they're gonna hear it or not. So we'll get to that in just a second. It's the same thing through U.S. District Courts. You get an appeal to the U.S. Court of Appeals or the Circuit Court of Appeals, right? And then you can appeal on a question of law, federal law, to the Supreme Court. There are millions of cases every year. There are thousands of cases where people write all of the writs. They do, I mean, have you guys ever gone, I know you spend a lot of time on the Supreme Court site looking at current cases, right? Okay, so when you do that next time, just go through and read some of the briefs. I mean, they're hundreds of pages long. There are thousands of cases that are appealed to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court hears about 100 a year, okay? They set their own jurisdiction using the rule of four. Four of them have to say, we wanna hear this case. So this is the structure generally, US District Courts. Where is the closest one to where we are? Where's the closest US District Court to Norman? Where they're gonna hear the facts. I heard Oklahoma City, you are correct. Oh, it was Eric. Oh, Eric. Sorry. <sighs> Should've went to law school. So, it's Oklahoma City, all right? That's the closest. Our closest Circuit Court of Appeal, or our Circuit Court of Appeal, right. where we appeal to, is in Denver, yeah. okay? That's the 10th Circuit. Look at the 9th Circuit. That's gigantic. Imagine the Ninth Circuit caseload, right? And you do get one appeal. The Ninth Circuit is crazy, okay? So going back just a second, trial courts, there's at least one per state. Oklahoma has three. Why does Oklahoma have so many? That's actually a lot for our population. Is one of them uh, because it's native? That's exactly right. Because it was Indian Territory as well as you know, the settled lands and things like that. So we have the Western District, Oklahoma City. We have the Northern District, that's in Tulsa. And we have the Eastern District, and that's in Muskogee. That's actually a lot for our population. And so our caseload isn't bad. Yeah. Uh, the OKC bombing being tried in Colorado. Um, okay, so as you guys know, it is 27 years. It's been 27 years. None of you were, how many of you were alive 27 years ago? Just me, great. Okay, so 27 years ago, there was a uh, domestic terror attack on the federal building in Oklahoma City. You guys know anything about that? There's a memorial, right? It's really beautiful, actually. But going inside of it is also very painful. It's very much like a Holocaust museum, it's tough. Go there on a the day whenever you don't mind being very sad. So. Um, but this bombing occurred, and the, the bomber was Timothy McVeigh, right? But he was not tried in the federal district court in Oklahoma City. Why not? Yes, Ellen? Huh? He requested a change of venue. Why would he do that? What? I heard something over here impartial jury yeah he was kind of looking for an impartial jury right <laughs> he was looking for somebody who hadn't just been bombed <laughs> right so he's looking for an impartial jury so he was however tried in Colorado um, and then found guilty there but it's going to involve a federal government or a federal question so bombing the federal government equals a federal case right 
um, citizens from two states if $75,000 or more is involved. Now, that said, if I want to sue somebody in local court and it's a $200,000 suit and they're from out of state, they can ask to remove it to federal court, but they can agree to hear it in state court too. Bankruptcy, Admiralty, and Maritime Supervision of Naturalization of Aliens. Now, I asked my last class this, and you guys are going to do better. I feel it. Okay? Now, they supervise the naturalization of aliens. However, what branch is responsible for making law about immigration and naturalization? That is incorrect. What branch is responsible? Exactly. The one responsible for writing the laws, Congress. Which would be? The legislative branch. The legislative branch, Congress. You guys just spent two to three weeks in your labs doing this as Congress. You guys remember that? Any, anything coming back to you? Yes? Good. It should come back to you for the exam. Just a hint. All right. Okay. So, uh, cases are typically decided by a single judge. The U.S. Courts of Appeal, um, they are going to hear the appeals and their decision is binding precedent over their entire region only, right? So anything at the uh, Circuit Court of Appeals of the 10th, it's going to apply to those states, the law of those states, but it's not going to apply to what's going on in the 11th. And so a lot of times the Supreme Court is just going to let it lie if there's a disagreement. Until it becomes really clear that, you know, let's say half of the uh, circuit courts are here and the other half are here, in which case they will then decide to issue writ and hear the case. Okay, does that make sense? So we see that happening with uh, Obergefell v. Hodges, where you have some circuit courts saying that states can make laws prohibiting same-sex marriage and other circuit courts saying they cannot. And so the Supreme Court says, hey, look, we have to make deciding law on this. Okay? This is the Supreme Court, mostly, um, minus Stephen Breyer. Can you guys tell me which one is Stephen Breyer? He just retired. The old man. <laughs> which, the old, which one is the old looking one, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> He's on the bottom. Right next to bottom, next to Elena King. Yeah, that, or Sonia Sotomayor. Sorry about that. Sonia yeah. Sotomayor. Uh, and so this is going to go here. We're going to have Alito. And then who's next? Clarence Thomas. Then who? Chief Justice? John Roberts. John Roberts. Then Stephen Breyer. Then Sonia Sotomayor. And then who's up top? These are the newbies. Brett Kavanaugh, followed by Elena Kagan. I gave you that name already. All right. And then oh Neil Gorsuch. And finally, <coughs> Amy Coney Barrett. Now, Stephen Breyer just retired. And so we have Ketanji Brown Jackson, who has taken his place on the court. But they have not set for their court photo yet for this session. We won't see it until. Otherwise, I would have done it with This is the best I could do, you guys. All right. So, how do we appoint these? When the American Bar Association, uh, first of all, how many of you are thinking about law school? Over here, anybody think about law school? One, over here, two, over here, three, okay. So three of you are thinking about law school. After your first semester of law school, you have to take an ethics exam. And as part of this exam, you also have to have both hands hand printed. I think you need a retina scan at this point too, but at the time I did it, that wasn't there yet. Um, and you have to um, do a mugshot, okay? And then you have to send all of that to the FBI. After one semester of law school, you have a file of the FBI. So I've had a file of the FBI since, uh, for a really long time much longer than any of you have been alive. And so the FBI has a file on me. Now, is there a lot in that file? Yes. Not really, right? There's just not that much. I mean, there's probably maybe something about my Oklahoma Supreme Court case that I had. There's probably something about um, the travel that I've done outside of the country, how much time I've spent outside of the country, and that's it. 
right? So not much, but it's a file, right? And so when the ABA, okay, looks at who they would say would be qualified, they create this list. And all presidents, since they started creating this list, has, have used this list, except for one, to make a decision, right? Are they very well qualified? If so, by the ABA, that's where I can start, okay? There's only one exception. They also then send that person to the FBI. When the FBI says, this is all the dirt I got, and they give them all the dirt. And then after that, if the president is satisfied that they will probably be able to make it through the uh, nomination and appointment process in the Senate, they send them to the Senate. Okay? And they do this with all federal judges, but with Supreme Court just, justices, it's obviously just a little bit more. The Senate started uh, having hearings on Supreme Court justices in the 1960s. Can anybody tell me why they started having hearings on Supreme Court justices instead of just saying, yes, very well qualified, and yes? Did they have something to do with FDR trying to pack the judiciary? No, that would have been the 1930s and 40s. So 1960s, yeah. Sort of, not exactly. That would have been the 50s. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. We're getting closer. All right. It's because the first Jewish justice had been nominated. That's the very first set of hearings that we have by the Senate. Okay? So did any of you listen to the last um, hearings on uh, Justice Ketanji Brown Jackson? A couple, right? Something that the senators often ask is, tell us about your religion. Right? Are they allowed to ask that? Yes, they're allowed to ask, but you don't have to answer. They're allowed to ask, but you don't have to answer. But the thing is this, the Constitution really clearly states that there are no religious tests required of officers of the United States government. But they started asking, right? So, um, it's uh, usually pretty contentious. Lately, it's become even more contentious. Um, the last three or four votes have been particularly contentious. Oh, Clarence Thomas's wife. That's a uh, yeah, and so there. that also brings us to a question: the way that the Supreme Court is, um, the Supreme Court is an entity and a branch unto itself, and so it doesn't have a lot of regulation outside. And so there's a real question: you know, if Jenny Thomas, who is the wife of Justice Clarence Thomas has been engaged in things that would um, be related directly to court matters, uh, should a justice have to recuse themselves? Right? I mean, that's a, that's a question, right? If, if I am, for example, at a trial court level, I have had people ask the judge to recuse himself because they decided the judge didn't like him, them whoever that person was. And the judge just said, okay, I'm out. Because it's not worth it. Because on appeal, if you show this bias, it can be overturned. But at the Supreme Court level, no such thing exists. And so Jenny Thomas in particular, what role she may have had in the January 6th insurrection means that should Clarence Thomas recuse himself from any cases having to do with the January 6th insurrection? That is a question, right? Okay. Uh, oh, sorry. In uh, at the district court level, I'm going to take roll really quickly. Actually, Eric, can you do it? Yeah. Okay. Um, at the district court level, at the district court level, when a president is appointing someone, a lot of times what they will do is they will just talk to the senators who are sitting senators, if those senators are in their party, in that state, and say, "Hey, who are you thinking?" And they'll say. We think this guy, he ran my last campaign. And the president will be like, that's cool. And the president will nominate them and they'll be appointed as long as there's nothing particularly bad, okay? And that is known as uh, senatorial courtesy, okay? It needs to be of their party, sitting senators in the state. Uh, Eric has made attendance live, so if you will take attendance, if you will say that you are here, that would be great. 
All right. So our next question is about two different things. And I want to be clear about something. Judicial activism is simply this. It is when the Supreme Court has come before it a piece of legislation and it overturns that legislation. Now, it may do it uh, because it is unconstitutional. It may do it because it's looking at the living constitution or original intent that says this is clearly unconstitutional. That's still activism, okay? Overturning a legislative body's decision, okay? It's still activism. And then restraint is saying, hey, you know what? We're just gonna let the people decide. This is a political question. We see a lot of that. This is a political question. And so if Congress decided that, we're gonna let it lie, okay? Now, with activism, <clears throat> Courts absolutely, justices absolutely take their own political preferences into account. There's no question about that. Dred Scott was an activist case. The civil rights cases of the 1880s, activist cases. The progressive movement trying to uh, pass laws so that there was no child labor, the Supreme Court overturned it. These are activist cases, okay? At the same time, you can certainly say that Brown versus Board of Education is an activist case. It is overturning the rule in the state. Okay? Anytime the Supreme Court overturns existing law or precedent, which is the same thing, but a rule or regulation or precedent, it is um, acting in an activist way. The Supreme Court for about, during the Warren Court and the Burger Court, uh, were often called liberal activist judges. How many of you have ever heard that phrase? From your uncle at Thanksgiving. Not just from your uncle, but yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, but some of you have. Liberal activist judges. There have not been liberal, the court has not been a liberal activist court since about 1978. Okay? It has been a conservative activist court since then. When we talk about cases like Citizens United, it's clearly an activist decision. All right, the Roberts Court has been a very activist court in terms of overturning uh, congressional law in favor of state power, in favor of um, business, right? Citizens United. That is completely separate and different from another type of judicial philosophy, right? Because this isn't really a philosophy. It's just saying, hey, look, you know, what is it that we are looking at here? The other thing is this. How do you look at the Constitution? Do you look at it as a living document, or do you look at it through original intent? And I would like to give you the example of the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was very strongly debated whenever it became the Second Amendment. The Second Amendment was strongly debated over a particular, for those English majors in here, um, particular piece of punctuation. Can anybody tell me what it was? I've narrowed it down to punctuation. Isn't it the comma before the rights of the state uh, shall not be infringed, that last clause? It's the comma, yeah, the right? Comma right before that. Because the question is, does that comma make the rights of the people yeah. a dependent phrase as opposed to a separate phrase, right? And the debate at the time, very clearly, if you look at the founders, the original intent was that the Second Amendment gave states the right to a well-regulated militia because people had the right to bear arms, okay? Dependent phrase. It was a state's right, very clearly. Over time, the way that we have perceived it is different, right? In 2010, the Supreme Court said, um, it's actually an individual right, okay? And applied it to the states, which is interesting. It was very clearly not a right of the federal government, it's a right of the states, but it wasn't an individual right. And so if we look at living constitution, then we would be looking at this idea that the constitution has changed in the way that we interpret 
the Second Amendment, right? Because of the times. So there's a way, there's a little, you know, quick thing here, but it's a little long and we're almost out of time. I recommend you watch it. It's going to talk about... 11,000. It's going to talk about important things like that. But my question for you is this. Should we, should we interpret the Constitution using original intent, or should we view it as a living document? 